All right, guys, I hate to come right back with another video, but I want to, I, I happen to come across something that's very interesting. Now, I was telling you about Job taking his eye, making a covenant with his eyes. Here it is. It says three critical steps to making a covenant with your eyes and overcoming lust. Uh, this is taken from uh, by, by Luke. Gelkerson is an article. You can Google it, Bible Counseling Coalition. Three critical steps to making a covenant and overcoming lust. It says, what is the I covenant? It says, in the ancient Near East, a covenant was a solemn pledge or promise. Job had committed to never gaze upon a young woman. Other translation says, look intently, look lustfully. Uh, or share or stare with desire stare with desire um, he committed to not let his heart be led by his eyes and instead he would take his thoughts captive and number one it says understand God's omnipotence God is omnipotent God is everywhere he's even in that little dark part of wherever you call yourself thinking God case, God can see all and everything. It says, following this uh, restatement of his eye covenant, Job asks, does not he see my ways and number all my steps? God sees all Job does. Nothing escapes his gaze. He never misses even the smallest detail. The Lord knows everything. He knows the number of hairs on your head and the number of stars in the sky. That's something the scientists don't even know. He know all that. And it says, sin thrives in secrecy. The illusion of invisibility gives a feeling of power. In that secret place, we can pretend to be ruler of our domain and be totally self-centered. When we retreat into our fantasy world or to our computer screens, believing no one can see us, we become like H.G. Wells' Invisible Man. <laughs> In the story, a bizarre sci scientific experiment renders Mr. Griffin completely invisible. Throughout the story, Griffin gets away with burglary, assault, arson, and is eventually driven mad by his own feeling of invincibility. To use an old Latin phrase, we must live coram dale before the face of God. There is no place so remote that we can escape his penetrating gaze. There is no place. Step two, it says, understand God's fatherly discipline. Number one is understand he's omnipotent. He's everywhere. Step two, understand his discipline. It says, what, what would be my portion from God above and my heritage from the Almighty on high? Job Acts 31 and 2. If Job allows lust to take hold in his heart, he expects calamity and disaster. God's discipline comes in many shapes and sizes, but like all discipline, it is never pleasant. Thinking of the discipline God measured out in King David's life after his sexual sin, Joint John Owens writes, Is it nothing to you that God should kill your child in anger, ruin your estate in anger, break your bones in anger, suffer you to be scandal, to be a scandal and reproach in anger, kill you, destroy you, make you lie down in darkness in anger? It may sound like Owen is laying it on too thick, but don't be quick to dismiss this. God disciplines those he loves. He hates your sin more than we like our comfort. This should sober us. There is something far worse than God's fatherly discipline. The prospect of his judgment. Let no one deceive you with empty words, Paul warns. For because of these things, sexual immorality, impurity, and covetousness, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience, Ephesians 5, 5 through 6. We can never let our heart become dull to God's hatred of sin. God has fatherly discipline for sin. 
So you can never let your heart becomes dull, become dull because the Lord hates sin. He hates it because that's why Jesus Christ was born, hung on a cross to cover your sin. And number three, make your pledge. Making a covenant is a definitive step, a line drawn in the sand. Make a covenant means saying to yourself, better yet, even writing this down, the words of your specific pledge. When a woman catches my attention, whether she is before my eyes or merely in my memory, I pledge to lead my thoughts elsewhere. Think of something else. I commit to this knowing almighty God both sees my sin and hates my sin. So when a woman or a man catches your attention or you remember it in the past, this person or whatever, it's a fleeting thought. <laughs> like my son do this in the air. He do this in the air. I said, are you catching something? I, I said, are you catching something? Catch your thoughts. Catch them. Say, uh-uh, that's in the past. That shouldn't be coming back up. I bind that in the name of Jesus. Lord, I don't want to have that thought. Think of something else. Say a scripture. Say a prayer. Pray about it. God, I don't want that. Because when those old thoughts come in, or somebody you've seen or said something to you, oh, I want to give you a number, whatever. Catch that thought and get rid of it quickly. It said, will this really work? To those who've heard this all before, this might sound simplistic, like making an empty promise. This is why our eye covenant needs to be made in the right spirit. We are not promising perfection. We are promising to fight. We're not promising perfection. Even Job knew he was guilty of sin. Jesus taught that the mark of a true disciple was not absolute purity, but a willingness to fight lust, tooth and nail. And that's Matthew 5, 29 through 30. You got to be willing to fight it tooth and nail. And then it says, we are not promising to win by willpower, but by faith. Making an eye covenant is about committing to a plan of action when temptation strikes. But this plan should not include a stubborn dependence on your willpower, which is Colossians 2, 20 through 23. It is rather the opposite. In the light of our great moral weakness, our eye covenant is a clearly marked exit ramp in your mind of how you plan to flee to God. Flee to God. The one who is stronger than any temptation you face. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 18, Hebrew 4, 14 through 16, he wants you to flee to him, come to him, come to him, come to him, take the thought to him. God, get rid of this thought for me. God, I don't want to think about this. Talk to him. Lord, strike it down. Help me to get this out of my mind, God. Right there, boom. Take it to God. Flee to God. Flee to God. Walk, walk and talk to God. We are making a pledge in light of God's grace. The almighty God that struck such fear in Job's heart was the same almighty with whom he was familiar as an intimate friend. Job 29, 4 through 5. God is not just a judge, but also a redeemer. 19 and 25 of Job. This kind of covenant with our eyes is a good first line of defense against the visual temptations you encounter. And then there's a conversation here. Uh, it's called Biblical Counseling Coalition. And then they have, uh, if you want to join the conversation about your eyes and making a covenant uh, with your eyes and, and with the Bible, how to flee to God in prayer when you have temptations that come before you. Because one, all it takes is an instant for something to enter in your eye and it's in your heart, saturated your soul, you know. You don't want to spend all your time on prayer about temptations and desires because there are other things that the Lord have for, for us in this earth that we should be doing. Not just all spending our time wrapped up with lustfulness and fleshly things. That's why it's a call to fast. You must learn to fast because it's teaching you to back away from the bread, <laughs> back away from those things that you love so much. Not only just the eating that we love, but whatever it is that we love, that's what fasting is about. That's what, that's what just, you know, taking that whole day of prayer and 
talking to God, reading your word, and just letting him surround your life so you can know what his will is for what you're trying to do. Because not all about what you're doing, it's about what he want to do. And, you know, what he want to do is always so much higher and greater and better than what you want to do. So that's what the fasting and the praying is all about. All right, guys, I got to take a little break here. Have a good night.